This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 57. Coming up on Space Time. A near-Earth asteroid's near miss, and we didn't even see it coming. The test flight of a new Australian orbital rocket fails to launch. And Sky Mapper, surveying the southern heavens. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. An asteroid as large as a football field has just flown past the Earth, with astronomers not detecting it until literally just a day before its closest approach. The giant space rock, thought to be up to 130 metres wide, came within 65,000 kilometres of Earth on July the 25th. In astronomical terms, that's about as close as it gets. The asteroid's been catalogued as 2019 OK. The European Space Agency says this near-Earth object's close approach illustrates the need for more eyes on the sky. ESA was able to observe the asteroid just before its flyby, requesting two separate telescopes in the International Scientific Optical Network, ISON, to take images of the space rock. The observations allowed astronomers to determine the asteroid's exact position and trajectory. The asteroid was first detected on the day before its closest approach by the Southern Observatory for Near-Earth Asteroids Research. Observations of 2019 OK were then independently confirmed by other observatories, including the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico and a third telescope in the ISAN network. Following its discovery, with knowledge of where the asteroid would have been in the past based on its current course and by manually searching for it by eye, existing images were found in the PanStars and Atlas Sky Survey archives. It turns out both surveys had in fact captured the asteroid in the weeks before its ultra-close encounter with Earth. But the space rock was moving so slowly it appeared to move just a tiny amount between the images and was therefore not recognised as a near-Earth object or NEO, and hence the seriousness of the threat wasn't appreciated. Of course, astronomers know of and are tracking thousands of asteroids across the solar system, so why was this one discovered so late? Well, unfortunately, currently there's no single obvious reason, apart from its slow apparent motion across the sky before its close approach. 2019 OK travels in a highly elliptical orbit, taking it from within the orbit of Venus out to well beyond that of Mars. Now, this means the time it spends near Earth, and therefore the time it's detectable with current telescope capabilities, is relatively short. Mind you, asteroids the size of 2019 OK are relatively common throughout the solar system, but they impact Earth on average only about once every 100,000 years or so. Still, an asteroid like that hitting a major city or urban area would cause major devastation and destruction. Based on its current orbital path through the solar system, the asteroid won't come close to Earth again for at least the next 200 years. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. An Australian suborbital test flight has failed before even getting off the ground. Gilmore Space Technologies' One Vision hybrid rocket suffered an anomaly at T-7 seconds when a pressure regulator in the oxidizer tank failed to maintain correct pressure. The company's chief executive, Adam Gilmore, says there was no explosion, though the rocket did suffer some damage. The test flight, using a specially constructed mobile launch pad on a property in outback Queensland, had planned to use a single stage to reach an altitude of around 30 kilometres. The test flight would have been the next step of the company's plans to develop a new orbital launch system based on its hybrid rocket engine. Back in 2016, the prototype reusable ascent separation article reached an altitude of around 5 kilometres. Gilmore Space Technologies plans to eventually test fly a three-stage commercial rocket capable of launching 250 kilogram payloads into low Earth orbit. And that'll be followed by a new clustered hybrid rocket engine vehicle for payloads up to 600 kilograms. No word yet on when the company's next test will be carried out, but we'll keep you informed. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The Australian National University Sky Mapper Telescope has now released well over 18 terabytes of Southern Sky Survey imagery. The second data release includes over 500 million unique astrophysical objects, almost 122,000 exposures and 4.7 billion detections, covering over 21,000 square degrees of sky. 
All of it matched against Two Mass, All Wise, Atlas, Reefcat 2, Gaia, Galex, Panstars 1, and UCAC 4 datasets. Sky Mapper will eventually observe every part of the southern sky 36 times and will generate more than 600,000 images. All this data will provide astronomers with an unprecedented amount of imagery and measurements of the southern skies from the Sky Mapper project. The first release of data from Sky Mapper was made back in December 2017, following many years of preparation by the ANU Sky Mapper team, together with scientists and technicians from the National Computational Infrastructure Project (NCI). NCI is a high-performance supercomputer cloud and data repository developed by the Australian National University, the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, Geoscience Australia and the Australian Research Council, along with more than 35 other Australian universities and eight ARC centres of excellence. The data is being released through the All Sky Visual Observatory, an online federated network of astronomical datasets hosted by NCI. Raw data from the SkyMapper telescope at the Siding Spring Observatory in Outback, New South Wales, is transferred directly to the NCI and then duplicated, with copies prepared on both high-speed global luster hard disk-based file systems and as tape-based archives. Having live access to the data allows astronomers to carry out image processing and brightness measurements of night sky objects. It categorizes objects within the raw night sky imagery, including stars, galaxies and asteroids, and even candidates in the ongoing search for our solar system's possible ninth planet. You may recall back in 2014, a new researchers using data from SkyMapper discovered the oldest known star in the universe. SkyMapper Principal Investigator Dr. Christian Wolf from the ANU says the project's generating some two petabytes of raw and calibrated data, which is being archived and made accessible on demand to scientists around the world. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. SpaceX has launched its Falcon Heavy rocket for the third time. The mission carrying 24 research satellites was a proving flight for the United States Air Force Space Test Program, designated as STP-2. The massive launch vehicle, complete with its three core boosters strapped side-by-side, blasted off from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. The launch had been delayed by three hours to complete additional ground system checkouts. Nine, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one, zero. Position. down range. T plus 25 seconds into flight under the thrust of over 5 million pounds. Falcon Heavy is headed to space. We're getting ready to throttle down for passing through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Max We've Q. heard call out of throttle bucket no, for side core. We're through max Q. Vehicle is supersonic. Everything continuing to look good on the Merlin 1D engines. We're throttling back up on the side boosters to full power. Performance looks nominal. Currently, the next event coming up, we'll hear call out of chillin of the MVAC D engine. That allows liquid oxygen to the top of the turbo pump. You get the second stage engine engine ready to chill for ignition in just a couple of minutes. We've begun to decrease thrust on the side boosters to minimize acceleration and loads on the Falcon Heavy structure. We've turned off one engine on each of the side boosters to decrease that load. Now our next major event coming up here in about 10 seconds, shutdown and separation of the side boosters. Booster shutdown. Booster separation confirmed. Over the cheering in the background. It's going on midnight, but a lot of people here Booster at SpaceX. Side boosters are separated. They're getting ready for their burn back to Cape Canaveral. The side boosters have ignited. The center core continues under full power. Everything looking good on the Falcon Heavy. Next event coming up in about 15 seconds will be shutdown of the center core, followed by stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. The two side boosters under the thrust of three engines each, slowing down their velocity and coming back towards Cape Canaveral. We have shutdown on the center core. Stage separation confirmed. We have successful separation and ignition. We're coming up on shutdown of the two side boosters. And we've heard the call out side booster boost back shutdown. The center core is not doing a boost back. It's headed downrange to the drone ship. Here comes ferry separation. 
clearing separation confirmed. We have confirmation of the payload clearing separation. So, so far, four minutes, 17 seconds into flight. Second stage looking good, headed to low Earth orbit, carrying the 24 satellites. The side boosters have done their first boon, coming back to Cape Canaveral. The center core has separated and is beginning its long coast downrange to the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. So at four minutes, 35 seconds and counting, everything looking good on Falcon Heavy. Now those side boosters are making their way back. Their grid fins on all three boosters should be deployed, and those are help guiding them to their landing zones. Side booster entry burn startup. And we have confirmation that the entry burn has begun. Pull the side booster FTS is safe to stage two FTS Talk is safe. In, terminal guidance. in about 20 seconds, we're going to look for that side booster landing burn to begin on both boosters. Side booster is transonic. The two boosters, which had previously flown on April's ArabSat 6A mission, returned to Earth safely, landing back at Cape Canaveral on landing zones one and two. Side booster landing burn startup. We've heard the call out for side booster landing burn startup and it's landing legs deployed. Side booster landing. What an iconic view. We've also at the same time, I believe we've had second engine cutoff at the same time. Before entry and landing is going to be risky. During entry, it'll face more heating and dynamic pressure than we've ever experienced on Falcon 9 or heavy flight before. Why, you ask? Because we have to lift the second stage higher and faster than other Falcon heavy flights in order to have enough performance in it to execute four burns into all the different orbits. So coming up at T plus 9 minutes and 39 seconds, we should see the center core entry burn ending. Center core entry burn. Looks like that was the confirmation for it to begin. Center core entry burn shut down. And we had just heard the confirmation that center core entry burn has shut down. And now that the entry burn is complete, the center core is moving back about 20% faster than it was at the end of the Falcon Heavy 2 Arabsat entry burn. First stage Cape LOS expected. Now we're coming up, we're just about a minute away from that center core landing burn beginning. And as we've been mentioning, Gearing this ship, will be the most landing. difficult landing that we've had to date. This will be a three engine center burn that Center, that center engine will start up first, and then two outer engines will start up as well for that landing burn. Stage one landing burn has started. And we have confirmation that the center core landing burn has begun. However, the central booster failed to land successfully on the drone ship, of course, I still love you, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. SpaceX boss Elon Musk euphemistically described the failure as a RUD, a rapid unscheduled disassembly. In other words, a crash and burn. Looks like our center core did not make it on our drone ship, of course. I still love you tonight. Again, as we've been mentioning, this was the most challenging landing that we've had to date. And this is this is our secondary mission. So our primary mission, we just heard the call out for a good orbit of our second stage. The Falcon's upper stage required four separate burns over six hours to get all the satellites into the correct orbits. In fact, the maneuvers are the reason why the launch required such a large rocket. The satellite payloads included six COSMIC-2 weather satellites. COSMIC stands for Constellation Observing System for Meteorology, Ionosphere and Climate. These kitchen oven-sized spacecraft are designed to improve global weather forecasting and space weather monitoring as part of an international project which includes Australia's Bureau of Meteorology. The Bureau's Middle Point Satellite Tracking Station near Darwin will help control the spacecraft. Each COSMIC-2 satellite carries a precision GPS receiver. As they orbit the Earth, the COSMIC-2 satellites are receiving navigational signals from GPS satellites. But the signals get distorted as they pass through Earth's atmosphere, a process known as radio occultation. What COSMIC-2 does, it detects these distortions in the signals and uses that data to determine atmospheric density, temperature, pressure and moisture levels in near real time. The spacecraft are also carrying three instruments designed to detect electron density and other space weather information. Also aboard the Falcon Heavy for this mission were satellites for NASA, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, various U.S. Department of Defense Research Laboratories, and university science payloads. These include a NASA experiment called the Green Propellant Infusion Mission, which is designed to test a less toxic, more efficient spacecraft fuel based around hydroxyl ammonium nitrate, which could eventually replace hydrazine, which is highly toxic. The new fuel will be tested in space on a propulsion system developed by Aerojet Rocketdyne and mounted on the platform provided by Ball Aerospace. If successful, it could allow future satellites to undertake longer mission durations, have more maneuverability, increase payload space, and easier launch processing. 
Also on this mission was NASA's U.S. Orbital Testbed Satellite, which is carrying a number of science experiments, including NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock. Developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, it's the first atomic clock designed specifically to fly on a spacecraft beyond Earth orbit. See, the thing is, atomic clocks, even those for spacecraft, are usually the size of a refrigerator. But this new timepiece is far smaller and lighter, only about the size of a toaster oven. It's designed to ultimately aid in the navigation of future deep space missions. Another experiment on the Falcon Heavy is the Enhanced Tandem Beacon Experiment, which uses two CubeSats to study how signals get distorted as they travel through hard-to-predict bubbles that form in the upper atmosphere. Because this region is affected by both weather on Earth and conditions in space, it's hard to predict just when and how these bubbles will form or how they'll mess with signals. This experiment will try and shed some light on that by sending radio signals between the two CubeSats as they orbit. Scientists will monitor these signals for distortions to work out exactly when the bubbles form and by how much they affect the signals. Another experiment, called the Space Environment Test Beds or SET, will study the impact high-energy particles such as solar radiation have on a spacecraft and their delicate electronics. The U.S. Naval Research Laboratory has two payloads on the flight. Their SWATs, the Small Wind and Temperature Spectrometer, which will study the dynamics of the upper layers of Earth's atmosphere. And there's the Tether Electrodynamic Propulsion CubeSat experiment, which will investigate orbital energy created by Earth's magnetic field, which could be used to propel future spacecraft. Operating in low Earth orbit, SWATs will monitor atmospheric densities, winds and temperatures while traveling in an elliptical orbit at altitudes between 350 and 700 kilometers above the surface. These measurements will improve models of Earth's ionosphere, which is key to over-the-horizon radar and long-range communications technologies. The Tether Electrodynamic Propulsion CubeSat experiment consists of two CubeSats connected by a kilometre-long tether. The system will collect electrons from the Earth's space environment and transmit the electrons from one CubeSat to the other. Its designers expect Earth's magnetic field to exert a force on the electrons in the tether, producing a velocity change that will affect both the magnitude and direction of the spacecraft. Probably the most highly publicised payload on this mission is the Planetary Society Solar Sail 2 CubeSat carrying Light Sail 2. The CubeSat, with Light Sail 2 folded up inside, is no bigger than a loaf of bread. It was deployed about an hour and 20 minutes after liftoff at an altitude of roughly 720 kilometres. If successful, Light Sail 2 will become the first spacecraft to raise its orbit around the Earth using just sunlight. Now, while light, actually photons, have no mass, they do have momentum and that momentum can be transferred to other objects. And the light cell is designed to harness this momentum for propulsion. Initially, light cell 2 will deploy four dual-sided solar panels, and that'll be followed by the unfurling of four giant triangular mylar sails on four metallic booms. The sails, which have a combined area of some 32 square metres, will turn towards the sun for half of each orbit, giving the spacecraft a tiny push no stronger than the weight of a paperclip. For about a month after cell deployment, this continual thrust should be enough to raise light cell 2's orbit by a measurable amount. The Planetary Society launched a nearly identical spacecraft called Light Cell 1 back in 2015. That successfully tested the spacecraft's cell deployment system. Now, if you're a fan of space-time's predecessor star stuff, you'll remember that we also reported it on Cosmos 1. That was the Planetary Society's first attempt to launch a light cell back in 2005. But the mission failed to reach orbit following the failure of the spacecraft's Russian-built rocket. This Falcon mission also carried an unusual payload of the dead. The payload was for a private company which organised cremated remains of people and even their pets to be sent into space. The remains will stay in orbit within capsules inside the satellite for a period of time before deorbiting and burning up as it re-enters the atmosphere. The Falcon Heavy's primary payload on this mission was the US Air Force's DSX satellite, which was also the last to be deployed from the launch vehicle's upper stage. The DSX, or Demonstration and Space Experiments mission, is designed to study killer electrons which could damage or destroy satellites in orbit. The probe was placed into an elliptical orbit ranging from 6,000 to 12,000 kilometers in altitude. This will allow the satellite to fly through both the inner and outer Van Allen radiation belts which surround the Earth. The year-long experiment will try to better understand how these harmful electrons are generated and consequently how they might be able to be mitigated. DSX will explore the role of wave-particle interaction in the dynamics of these killer electrons. It will do this by using a transmitter sending out very low-frequency radio waves using an 80-meter-long dipole antenna to see exactly how they interact with the electrons. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. 
A new study suggests increased levels of vitamin A in your diet could lower your risk of developing cutaneous squamosal cell carcinoma, or SCC, one of the main types of skin cancer, along with basal cell cancer and melanoma. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on two long-term study groups involving some 25,000 health professionals and included a follow-up period of over 26 years. The authors say that while the findings do show an association between the protective nature of vitamin A against SCC, more research is needed in order to determine whether this would also be the case for vitamin A supplements. The best sources of vitamin A include cod liver oil, eggs, fortified breakfast cereals, fortified skim milk, orange and yellow vegetables and fruits such as carrots, and through beta-carotene such as that found in broccoli, spinach and most dark green leafy vegetables. A new study warns that some medicines prescribed to reduce stomach acid, commonly used to treat gastric ulcers and reflux, have been found to be associated with an increased risk of developing allergies. A report in the journal Nature Communications says researchers studied prescription medicine records for over 8 million people between 2009 and 2013. They found those needing stomach acid inhibitors were twice as likely to later also begin needing anti-allergy medications in the following years. This was especially prevalent in women and in older individuals. The authors suggest that because these meds are interfering with the way stomach acid breaks down food, larger proteins may be making it through to the intestines where they can trigger immune responses. A review of the world's most accurate and up-to-date scientific analyses has confirmed beyond any doubt that recent warming events have been unmatched in the past 2,000 years. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on climate data from a vast library of research papers. Scientists used seven different statistical methods to look at 2,000 years of global data on average temperatures. They found the largest warming trends all occurred in the second half of the 20th century, corresponding to a dramatic increase in the use of coal and oil, and an associated increase in the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Scientists say the data highlights the unusual character of warming in recent decades. A second report examined the rates of surface warming and driving forces and also found that all rates of warming were fastest in the latter 20th century. Thieves have been busy with a new email scam in which victims are receiving emails that appear to be coming from their own email account. The scammers are threatening to reveal intimate images of them unless they pay up. The Australian Cyber Security Centre, the Office of eSafety Commissioner and Scamwatch are now receiving hundreds of reports about the scam. The scam uses a tactic known as sextortion. It's a form of online blackmail where a cyber criminal threatens to reveal intimate images of someone online, often to their friends and family, unless they agree to pay a ransom quickly and often in untraceable cryptocurrency. The scam uses a process called spoofing to make the email look like it's come from your own email address. Email spoofing is quite easy. It occurs when email addresses are manipulated to come from a different source but display a legitimate email address. It's a technique commonly used by cyber criminals to make their scams seem more real. Now, if you get one of these emails threatening to reveal intimate images of you online, do not give in to the demands. Stop all contact with them and report it to the office of the eSafety Commissioner. A new study has found that having the talk with your kids won't delay them from having sex, but it might encourage them to engage in safer sex practices such as using condoms. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on a review of clinical trials which concluded that while the birds and bees talk didn't lead to huge changes in whether or not teens have sex, being able to talk about sex with their parents did help teens make better choices. An accompanying editorial says most programs aimed at improving safe sex among teenagers only focus on the teens themselves, but this research suggests that parents need to be better skilled at talking about sex with their kids. After more than 25 years, the University of Technology Sydney has finally joined the growing list of academic institutions around the world, dropping degrees in so-called traditional Chinese medicine. Of course, the decision has angered alternative medicine practitioners, especially those engaging in acupuncture and herbal services. But a UTS review of the Chinese medicine department found it should be wound up at the end of 2021 because it was no longer financially viable, did not produce enough research, and couldn't fit in with the science faculty. 
Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out there are simply no credible peer-reviewed scientific studies showing any real medical benefit from traditional Chinese medicine other than a slight placebo effect. Basically, they've just made the decision to drop both the courses they're doing, teaching traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, and also apparently closing a clinic that they've been running as well. Is this all part of the Confucius program that the Chinese government are running through Australian universities, or universities around the world, really? Yeah, it's been hard to say exactly, yeah, sort of which of the universities are being sort of supported directly by Chinese. Certainly there's the University of Western Sydney has the um, Institute of Complementary Medicine and that, that has very strong links with China. This one I don't know. This one it just seems that at the same time they're claiming that it wasn't actually making any money or that, that it actually wasn't just wasn't viable but they've also obviously had some feedback from the, the Faculty of Science who were not particularly impressed that they're running this. People keep claiming that traditional Chinese medicine has been around several thousand years so it must work. It's uh, only been around market for it. Mao, hasn't it? It has only been yeah, exactly. I mean, th- there was the suggestion that Tim and Mao wanted people to pick up this because it didn't cost a lot of money and because the actual Western medicine, which they were preferring, was actually uh, requiring a greater investment. So they said, you know, you should do TCM and it's not going to cost us that much. I believe, though, that the authorities, Tim and Mao himself, etc., did use Western medicine, so did not necessarily put his, his health where his, his words were. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 